America has decided to arm herself for protection against any aggressor. And the assembly lines of the automobile industry now become assembly lines of defense. The same men who in the past 20 years designed and built over 70 million passenger cars and trucks are bending their wills and their talents to the task of building weapons for the protection of America. The ability of the automobile industry to serve America's defense is solidly based on tangible achievements in times of peace. Achievements that resulted from years of research. In the laboratories has been exemplified the indomitable spirit that is the automobile industry. Here, individual initiative is encouraged. Here are courageously conceived the engineering concepts that boldly challenge competition. Millions for research. In the past dozen years, Chrysler Corporation alone has spent $60 million to find out how to make cars safer and more durable and more economical. And manufacturing has progressed hand in hand with engineering. The designs of the engineer have been translated economically and efficiently into terms of metal and plastic, of fabric and glass and rubber. In the past dozen years, the Chrysler Corporation has spent $180 million for tools and dyes to give the public each year what is new and of permanent value. Then the picture changed and defense became the number one job. America began to arm on land, at sea, and in the air. And the Chrysler Corporation went one of the toughest assignments of all as its second big job for national defense. The first task was already well underway, but part of Chrysler Corporation's truck building capacity had already been diverted from production of civilian vehicles and more than 250 Dodge Army trucks were being turned out each day. But no one in the United States had ever turned out giant 31-ton tanks in mass quantities. Such a task was a challenge to the men who over the years had been spurred on by our competitive American system of incentive and initiative to invent, to build, to achieve, to compete in producing better products. Backed by broad experience and research, they were ready to meet their nation's call. First, an arsenal about five city blocks long and two city blocks wide had to be constructed in Detroit. More than 1,000 new tools and heavy pieces of machinery had to be designed and built. Production problems entirely different from those met in automobile and truck production had to be worked out. And above all, thousands of men had to be selected and trained especially for this new job of building tanks. A big enough order when there's plenty of time, but an even bigger task when under pressure. Just five days after the call to action, Chrysler Corporation engineering and production experts returned from inspecting a model tank at Rock Island Arsenal armed with blueprints, 186 pounds of them. And in the four and a half weeks that followed, 200 men from the Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto and Chrysler plants, selected for their knowledge, ability and initiative, studied these blueprints. Never before had so many of these experts worked on one particular job. Working seven days a week, Hours meant nothing to them as they checked and rechecked rigid specifications laid down by the United States Army and conceived and planned the tools and giant machinery needed to produce in quantity these important weapons for Uncle Sam. Simultaneously and working in perfect coordination, other Chrysler men planned the layout of the arsenal building itself. Expending more than $200,000 of its own money for planning even before the go-ahead signal was given, Chrysler Corporation pushed forward this national defense job with all possible speed. On August 15th, it was authorized to construct a $20 million tank arsenal and to build 31-ton tanks. A job had to be done, and Chrysler Corporation was determined to do it. In less than a month, first ground was broken for the arsenal. Huge steam shovels like fabulous monsters foraging for food dug out massive chunks of earth to make way for deep foundations. Vast amounts of construction equipment, tractors, cranes, and graders arrived. And the excavations took on an appearance resembling a busy mining camp. Concrete, more concrete, and still more concrete. 51,000 tons, most of it poured at temperatures near zero, went into the foundations of the arsenal itself 
and into the especially deep foundations for extra heavy machinery, and into large floor areas and road beds for the railroad sidings which were to run into the factory. Meanwhile, behind locked doors, preparation for tank production went forward. Army officers and Chrysler men, experts all, worked side by side to produce armament for America's defense. Working untiringly, production engineers designed the jigs, dies, tools, and machinery necessary for mass production. Other experts worked night and day to plan the most efficient plant layout. Uncle Sam had asked for action, and action he got. Steel construction followed close on the heels of the foundation work. Fighting now against the bitter cold of a Midwestern winter, as well as time, hearts warmed to see the first steel upright swing into position and willing hands quickly bolted it solidly into place. With the first steel uprights pointing slim, rigid fingers skyward, steel construction went forward at a record pace. Steel, more than 13 million pounds of it. More than 20,000 large pieces went into the construction of the vast plant. Ah, what's this, a bottleneck? We don't envy you the job of sorting those out, brother. Cold, snow, ice, rain, Nothing deterred the building of the immense structure. Men, ankle and sometimes almost knee deep in mud, worked with determination. Trucks plowed through to their destination, delivering their vital cargoes of supplies and materials. And then came a red letter day. In the presence of Major General E.B. Gregory, Quartermaster General of the United States Army, the official flag was presented and raised over the tank arsenal. Then on strict schedule, carloads of production tools and new machinery began to arrive at the arsenal, ready for immediate installation. More men, more materials, and still more speed. Bricks and mortar, steel and glass, and the vast skeleton of a building began to gain a more solid appearance. With wiring completed inside the plant, men hurried to finish the flooring, while high above them, fellow workers rushed to weatherproof the roof. Another red letter day marked, the one-third completion of the arsenal. Ever mindful of their fight against time, production engineers partitioned off this one-third. Then with the arsenal steel construction still to be completed, and with only this part of the interior temporarily heated by means of a locomotive, building of the first sample tanks went forward in earnest and Uncle Sam's defense program began to assume definite, more tangible form. Meanwhile, work on the arsenal itself continued at a rapid pace, while day by day, hour after hour, new machinery was moved in according to a carefully coordinated plan, even as hundreds of designers, draftsmen, and engineers supervise the building and installation of more machinery for mass tank production from assembly lines of defense. Time was precious, and certainly none was wasted here. Exactly as planned, every huge milling machine, each giant multiple drill press, every single piece of machinery, large and small, had its predetermined foundation and location in the arsenal's layout. Fortunately for America, the most important assignments in its defense program were taken over by industries skilled and experienced in scientific research. Moving at top speed, the national defense program benefited by the wealth of experience gained by America's number one industry over a period of years. The engineering and production skill that had given America constantly better and better automobiles and trucks for less and less money went into the planning and building of these giant tanks for America's defense. No time was lost in training skilled workmen in the jobs they were to do, as preparations for quantity production began to assume even larger proportions. With the mass moving in of giants of modern industrial production came a myriad of small machines, literally hundreds of them, all tagged and clearly marked, each with its own important place in production, each with its vital job to do. More than 8,000 specially designed tools and gauges and fixtures were also to be installed before the arsenal would be completely equipped. The arsenal became just that in the truest sense of the word. Strictest official secrecy was enforced. Incoming and outgoing men and vehicles were carefully checked and inspected. 
the race to produce the tanks, way ahead of schedule, was well underway. The full power of private competitive industry, its manpower, its resources, its facilities, was again proving its worth when turned to the job of America's defense. And the seemingly impossible became an accomplished fact. Where less than six months before had been only an open cornfield, now a huge tank arsenal was producing its first sample two-room tanks. Here was a crawling juggernaut of modern warfare, constructed of the world's finest armor steel, assembled by the very engineers and experts who planned its production, with a gross weight equal to that of a five-room frame house. Its upwards of 35,000 parts were assembled with skill and precision. And nearby, number two tank, a second sample job, was also already well on its way toward completion. Here indeed was forceful evidence of industry doing a job for defense. Uncle Sam wanted speed and performance, and he got it. And the arsenal which was to produce them in the quantities required was a truly great monument to the spirit of American men and American industry. Here is proof that the spirit of freedom and private competitive enterprise is able to meet a challenge. Into this effort of first-line defense went the full skill and all-out energy of American men bound in cooperative endeavor to provide the world's finest arms and armament for our Army and Navy. The first crowning climax to this record-breaking achievement the transformation of a peaceful farmland into a powerful arsenal for the mass production of tanks was achieved with the delivery to the Army on April 24th of the first full-armed, ready-for-combat M3 medium tank made by American industry. In keeping with the spirit and cooperation that went into its planning and production, this first sample tank was presented to the Army as a gift from Chrysler distributors, dealers, and their salesmen paid for with funds which they themselves freely contributed. At the presentation ceremonies, Harry Somers of Atlanta said, I represent Chrysler distributors, dealers, and salesmen from all parts of the United States. When we first heard the news that Chrysler Corporation had undertaken to build tanks for our government, we wanted in some way to participate. We decided to ask to buy, with funds contributed by ourselves, the very first tank to be built here, and to present it to the United States Army with our compliments. After making the formal presentation over a national radio hookup, the thanks of the United States Army was expressed by Major General Charles M. Wesson, Chief of Ordnance, in the presence of Governor Murray D. Van Wagener of Michigan, and many other high-ranking government, state, and army officials. From specially built grandstands and other points of vantage, the entire assembly witnessed the first tank in action as it demonstrated its strength, maneuverability, and firing power. Pride of accomplishment surged in the minds and hearts of the onlookers as the 31-ton giant was put through its paces. Here was a giant weapon for streamlined modern warfare. Swiftly moving walls of tough, bullet-resisting steel, able to move over difficult terrain at better than 25 miles an hour. Mobile, flexible, fast. Military experts acclaimed these American Army tanks better than any similar mechanized war equipment, a mighty safeguard for our nation. General Wesson and President K.T. Keller of Chrysler Corporation watched the mighty moving fortress as with cannon booming and machine guns chattering, fully ready for frontline action, nothing hindered its progress. Climax of the day was the unheralded appearance of the second tank which had been completed that very day. American men and American industry had carried out the Army's order of the day and had taken a major step toward arming the country for defense. But proud and impressive as were these ceremonies, they were but an incident marking progress in the big job to be done. For as the first tank was shipped, others were on their way. The cool, keen, swift, coordinated action which had marked the building of the arsenal and the construction of the first sample two-room tanks, now gave way to the job of assembly line tank production. This great defense effort began to reap the harvest of its labors as production tanks filled the first assembly line, then the second. 
Relentlessly rolling, the third assembly line was filled, and mass production was on the way. All hands turned to the job of building tanks in volume. Smooth American business-like coordination and cooperation is the keynote in production as it was in preparation. Free, patriotic cooperation, the American way. Quantities of all manner of parts, mighty steel armor plate, cast steel forgings of varying sizes and designs, mighty two-ton turrets, each a veritable fortress in itself, stand ready to feed these assembly lines of defense. From the largest tank part down to the smallest, each is ready to do its job in Uncle Sam's new arm strength. All materials brought together from more than 700 factories located in 130 communities throughout the country are carefully checked to specifications for strength, measurements, and weight. For Uncle Sam must take no chances. Veteran expert machinists mill contact surfaces to hair-splitting specifications. Giant multiple drills bore through the toughest metal Row upon row of intricate, specially designed machinery manufacture and prepare the 35,000 or more individual parts that go into each land dreadnought. Welding, milling, riveting, measuring and remeasuring vital parts to hair splitting dimensions. Then, at the beginning of the main assembly line, the hull sub assembly begins to take on a vaguely recognizable shape. Rubber cushion wheels are set into place, ready to run onto caterpillar treads at the end of the line. On down the line, more and more parts and inner fittings are added until the tank is ready for the paint oven and its first coat of United States Army olive green. Next comes the big radial motor capable of pushing this land battleship at a speed of 25 miles per hour. The 3,600 pound swivel gun turret is swung into position its ruggedness seeming to hurl defiance at any who might challenge it. Then the vital caterpillar tread is added. With armament complete, the tank's guns, including the formidable 75 millimeter cannon, are mounted in place. And Uncle Sam's answer to all challengers is ready for a 75 mile test before delivery to the army, complete and ready to defend America. Thus, from these assembly lines of defense, roll defenders of America in ever-increasing numbers. Chrysler Corporation is proud of this record in tank production, but it is only one phase of its part in the vast national defense program. Every division of Chrysler Corporation, Chrysler, DeSoto, Dodge, and Plymouth, is also doing its important jobs for first-line defense. Special Army trucks are coming off the lines at the Dodge truck plant at the rate of more than 250 every working day and have been for many months. Aluminum alloy forgings for defense work from the new Dodge forge plant. Parts for nose and center section fuselages for Martin medium bombers from Plymouth and all other Chrysler Corporation divisions. Field kitchens, propeller balancers, tent heaters, furnaces and refrigerator compressors for Army cantonments from the air temp plant in Dayton, Ohio. Parts for 40 millimeter rapid fire Bofors anti-aircraft guns from the Chrysler, the DeSoto, and seven other plants in Detroit and Newcastle, Indiana. And in Chrysler Corporation's famous engineering laboratories, development work progresses on a new 2,000 horsepower airplane engine, new military truck designs, airplane landing gears, multiple engine power plants, and many other engineering assignments for the United States Army and Navy. In addition, orders have been filled for fuses which go into the noses of airplane bombs, for three-inch shells, and for three-inch cartridge cases, oil light -like bearings, and other powdered metal parts for various defense items. These and many other Chrysler Corporation activities are examples of how the wheels of the automobile industry, symbolic of all private competitive enterprise, turn together in unison to supply the nation's requirements. Thus do the brains, hands, and hearts of free American men work to carry out the armies and the navies orders of the day on assembly lines of defense.
are courageously conceived the engineering concepts that boldly challenge competition. Millions for research. In the past dozen years, Chrysler Corporation alone has spent $60 million to find out how to make cars safer and more durable and more economical. And manufacturing has progressed hand in hand with engineering. The designs of the engineer have been translated economically and efficiently into terms of metal and plastic, of fabric and glass and rubber. In the past dozen years, the Chrysler Corporation has spent $180 million for tools and dyes to give the public each year what is new and of permanent value. Then the picture changed, and America has decided to arm herself for protection against any aggressor. And the assembly lines of the automobile industry now become assembly lines of defense. The same men who in the past 20 years designed and built over 70 million passenger cars and trucks are bending their wills and their talents to the task of building weapons for the protection of America. The ability of the automobile industry to serve America's defense is solidly based on tangible achievements in times of peace. Achievements that resulted from years of research. In the laboratories has been exemplified the indomitable spirit that is the automobile industry. Here, individual initiative is encouraged. Here, under pressure. Just five days after the call to action, Chrysler Corporation engineering and production experts returned from inspecting a model tank at Rock Island Arsenal, armed with blueprints, 186 pounds of them. And in the four and a half weeks that followed, 200 men from the Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto, and Chrysler plants, selected for their knowledge, ability, and initiative, studied these blueprints. Never before had so many of these experts worked on one particular job. Working seven days a week, hours meant nothing to them as they checked and rechecked rigid specifications laid down by the United States Army and conceived and planned the tools and giant machinery system of incentive and initiative to invent, to build, to achieve, to compete in producing better products. Backed by broad experience and research, they were ready to meet their nation's call. First, an arsenal about five city blocks long and two city blocks wide had to be constructed in Detroit. More than 1,000 new tools and heavy pieces of machinery had to be designed and built. Production problems entirely different from those met in automobile and truck production had to be worked out. And above all, thousands of men had to be selected and trained especially for this new job of building tanks. A big enough order when there's plenty of time, but an even bigger task when defense became the number one job. America began to arm on land, at sea, and in the air. And the Chrysler Corporation went one of the toughest assignments of all as its second big job for national defense. The first task was already well underway, but part of Chrysler Corporation's truck building capacity had already been diverted from production of civilian vehicles and more than 250 Dodge Army trucks were being turned out each day. But no one in the United States had ever turned out giant 31-ton tanks in mass quantities. Such a task was a challenge to the men who over the years had been spurred on by our competitive American 